Awesome. Okay, so we're recording. Okay, so welcome everyone um, to tonight's Next Gen Zoom meeting. A um, few new faces again. So again, tonight I'm in a different location. We're at Lakes Brigade and we've got um, six guys here tonight to talk through. So I'd like to introduce Phil Lukes, who is the captain. Um, I'm the camera person today, so I'll just uh, flick the camera around and we'll go from there. Actually, I might sorry, flick my computer around. And Phil, there you go. Well, thank you, Sarah. It's good to uh, be here tonight and spend a bit of time talking about uh, road crash and um, technical rescue that Lakes Entrance and then staff members uh, are involved in. Tonight we've got uh, Lee over the back here. We've got John. We've got Les. We've got Anthony and BJ. So uh, we've got a range of people with all sorts of different skills. So I'll give a little bit of a history about Lakes Entrance. So Lakes Entrance Brigade is about 90 years old. And uh, we've got about 20, almost 30 active members. So pretty involved in uh, all the things that we do. I'll talk a little bit about um, what, we, what we do in a minute. But the reason why we do, and we became involved in road crash mm -hmm. was back in the late 80s and into the early 90s, we were attending some of these MBAs and uh, there was no one with equipment to be able to uh, help get people that were involved in these accidents out. So. Um, we set to ask to undertake becoming accredited and then to um, get access to vehicles so that we can um, make sure that our community um, had someone or a group of people that could uh, expedite that aspect of putting rescue in place in this area. And many of you that do know the area knows that Christmas time and Easter time, it's really crazy here, a lot of people. Um, but you know, it can be any time, like, you know, anything can happen at any time. So the skills and the competencies that Lakes Entrance have, of course we do tonight, we're talking about road crash. We do technical rescue, so that's steep angle rescue, and we work in conjunction with SES as well. So, and those members of SES, not just in Lakes Entrance, Ben, Star, Ruth, and, uh, and elsewhere in those kids, and we team up to respond anywhere we need to go. So to give you, uh, and not only that, we do um, grass scrub, bush, structure, hazmat, uh, work with marine rescue as well. We're the only brigade in the state that does all that range. So to keep up our competency in all of that means it's a pretty busy brigade. Um, we have about uh, high 40s in numbers of people on the books, so that's support people as well as those, as I mentioned, about 30 people that are active. Um, just to give you a context of the area that East Gippsland covers, it's 20,940 square kilometres. So that's a pretty big number. So 20,940 square kilometres. Uh, and for technical rescue, so the rope aspect, we cover 100% of that area. So that's massive area. And for road crash, it's about 70% of that sort of demographic area as well. So not only is the distance uh, really something that challenges us and people in East Gippsland when something goes air-shaped, it's also uh, the topology that we have to cover. So yeah, we've got beautiful lakes and you know, oceans and beach, and yeah, we've been on the beach on multiple times too. We've been on boats many times, um, we've got mountains, we've got snow, we've got ice, we've got dirt roads everywhere as well as highways that go through. So the range and the space that we have to cover is enormous and varying dramatically. Uh, in that area here, yeah, there's a lot of cliffs and very, very rough and rugged country. So just to give you a bit of a snapshot. I've got a few notes here and I'm just gonna keep referring to that just for this next bit before I hand over some of the others to run through with you. Um, a little while back, we undertook um, working alongside our Bansdale, amazing people, to um, work alongside getting them to be uh, involved in road crash. 
Um, and we rely heavily on the members from Dan's staff. So I'll talk a little bit later about what's been happening just lately, but um, these people have also um, all undertaken the technical rescue aspect as well. So we work as a very close-knit team, don't we, Liz? Yes, we do. Yeah. yeah, so it's really important that we have that um, understanding and that camaraderie and that we train together. So we undertook some training last week um, with the appropriate numbers in the appropriate space, distance and all that stuff. But I've just got to put that out there. So we do the right thing, but we've got to continue doing that. But as I mentioned before, the technical rescue is involving SES. Um, We've been really fortunate that District 11, which is our patch, D11, um, people there have been very supportive in helping us to achieve and maintain our schools. So I'll take my hat off to them for their support. Um, doesn't mean it's always smooth sailing because they've got restraints, but we work through all that stuff together. And um, SRO Rick Owen, who's been an amazing support for uh, rescue brigades and you know I take my hat off to Rick as well for all the support that he's given Lakes Entrance and all those other people who undertake uh, rescue. Uh, our DMOs um, look after our appliances and it's a real team effort so great thing. So look, just over the last three weeks we've had some pretty difficult call outs and some pretty confronting uh, life-threatening um, incidents that we've turned up to and um, yeah, with people that are trapped with very, very severe life-threatening uh, injuries. We're very fortunate being so far away from any major hospitals that Hallingmead have responded to those. And uh, one of the incidents we had two, two choppers on the ground and they were on the ground for three hours while the work was uh, occurring, not just getting people out, but stabilising them, ready to send them off to Melbourne. And there's been some good news out of that on some of it and the rest of them we're not sure about. Um, look, those people in Halimed are incredible. I think all of us agree, you know, for doing surgery on the edge of the road, they actually conduct incredible sorts of things. Being in the country, we get to know a lot of the people we work with. So Vic Pohl, Yambos, SES, we've got this amazing bond. And uh, we, when we get to a scene, it's really important that you know, who's who in the zoo, we work really well together, uh, very closely. Our neighbouring brigades, all the brigades in District 11 that we respond to in those areas play a very important role. And um, our brigade has often gone out and done some work with those brigades to give them a bit of an understanding about what it takes to set up a scene for when we are turning up at a, a particular incident. So. Um, just an example, um, one particular job that we had with a rollover with two uh, severely injured patients that were trapped in a vehicle. I'll mention Jody because he did a fantastic job. Um, he was on the radio. Uh, he gave us the information that we needed. So if any, anyone's listening in whatever brigade you belong to, if you are ever responding to an MBA, and you're giving information to a rescue brigade coming on scene. Giving that information just makes an enormous difference to help paint a picture. For instance, Jody said, two persons trapped, vehicle on its roof, unconscious breathing patients. Um, and then afterwards, he came back onto the radio and said, how far away is the rescue? And so quite simply by it was cool and calm, but you could tell Elevated was giving us information that it was really critical. So, um, so that's important. I want to talk a bit about mental health. Mental health of all of us is really important. And um, you never sign up in the CFA to see some of the stuff that you, you see. Um, I only need to think about the fires uh, north of Melbourne the other day. People would have responded to that, would never have wanted to turn up to those sorts of incidents. So just looking after your mental health is really important. That's something that we do all the time. Um, I want to talk about 
one particular job that we spoke about last week where there was a triple fatality um, that we responded to. Three local people that we knew were involved. Um, and having to deal with that, to give a, give a perspective of what it's like to live in country versus city when you know your patch and you know your people, there is high likely chance that you might at some stage go to an MBA where there will be people that you know. Um, Cass, some of you will know Cass, who helped train us become accredited in rescue and has been there for many years, rang uh, as part of that job and he said, Phil, how are you and how's your crew? And I just gave him a bit of a brief and he goes, in all the years I've been attending rescues, standing on the area and that patch, he said, oh, I've never been to an MBA, we've done thousands. I've never been to an MBA where I've ever known anyone. So for us, mental health is a big thing. So we have diffusions and debriefs, we use peers often, and we make sure that we um, tap into psychologists to make sure that we take care of each other. I just wonder whether, just going around everyone here, whether they'd like to talk about maybe a technical aspect of the job that you've attended. Um, there's quite a few that probably come to mind. I'll, I'll kick off with one. And if some of you were at this job. We turned up a, where a vehicle had gone over an edge. So to get any of the graphic stuff, it's technical difficulties that sometimes you've got to go. Over multiple times, driver was in the vehicle, partway out the car, partway in the car, and he was um, he was trapped not only inside the cab, but part of him was pinned underneath the car. So the technical aspect of having to work it, how do you get someone out? And he look, he's fine, he's absolutely fine um, in the end, but just working on the complications of how do you lift the vehicle and make space at the same time, you know, and so. <coughs> That was a job that we went to at two o'clock uh, at two in the morning, I think. By the time we got home, it was well after daybreak. So, yeah. Any jobs? Uh, I'll be involved with this one. Just... Oh, one that comes to mind is uh, one we attended uh, that um, they said there was a truck into a tree. And uh, when we got there, it was a truck into a tree, all right. He, he basically wrapped the whole front of the little cab out of the truck right around the tree. And he was wedged in there very, very hard. And it was one of those jobs where where do you start finding him out? Because he was crushed basically behind the steering wheel and the whole dashboard. And uh, when you start looking at things like that, it's, you know, where can we start doing the best work possible? Um, so I think the first thing we did was we, we tipped the roof off, uh, then we cut the right door, then we started cutting the, down the back to try and relieve a bit of pressure from him while he was sitting in the, um, in the uh, cab. Uh, eventually, we got him at the cut part of a tree away, also, so you never know what you're going to have to use to, uh, to do something like that. But, um, yeah, that's a step one of one job. Remember? Mm -hmm. um, one of the ones I've been to is um, with the rope rescue, we don't always have a, a clear line of sight down to where the patient might be. So. Um, where you, your anchor up from might be the only spot you can go, but you'll have to redirect the rope, and it comes a bit of a bit of a uh, marathon to try and pull up one area and then change, and then come back up on another angle. Um, it, it can get pretty challenging. So, you know, your experiences, uh, you've come from another brigade, and your involvement hasn't been necessarily in either of these areas, but you've been supporting you know, guys for a number of years. Yeah. I guess something that is, <laughs> that's important is that, like, we're not road crash accredited yet, um, but there's plenty of opportunity for people that aren't road crash accredited <laughs> to actually be involved in, in the aspect of road crash. You know, it takes, as Phil said, it takes a team to take in a, in a road crash. And, you know, that means everybody from the people on the tools to the people stopping traffic and looking at it. So, I've sort of been involved with a little bit in that aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, the, the technical aspects of what we do is, is complicated and every job's different. And I guess as much as we train, it's very hard to 
trying to a specific job, it's more about adapting and evolving with the job. Uh, sometimes we, we attend easy ones, and other times you've got to unpack the person from a motor vehicle that's been involved in an accident. So the technicality is always varying, and uh, as much as we try and protect it, we're always learning on the job as well. So. Yeah. Probably just a couple of things to finish off with before we... Yeah. Oh, no, I was just going to say um, yep. my experience is um, in the pouring rain on the highway in the thunderstorm and lightning. Um, yes that we were operating, were holding a, holding a tarp up for the paramedics to try and get in the car and we we're trying to get in. And yeah, thunderstorm lightning in the middle of the highway. So you've got to be prepared for anything and everything. I think that's a really important thing, Sarah, that, you know, what you're saying is very true. And it's a bit like what DJ is saying. Um, after an MBA, we'll do a diffusion and a debrief it's really important that everyone that's involved in that aspect, um, you know, they're able to respond to those um, diffusions, which means just talking about and unpacking it, having the opportunity. If they want to talk, great. If they don't want to, that's fine as well. But DJ's right. It's everyone on the job is part of that team. So, yeah. So just for people's awareness, if you go to an MBA and there are skid marks, please avoid driving over or walking over skid marks. Um, it's really, it's a crime scene. Any MBA will be treated right from the start as a crime scene. So we've got to protect and preserve the scene as best we're able to. So if you rock up on scene, yes, if there are people trapped, that's life comes first, absolutely. But just maintain what you can, keep things in place as you best able to. Set up the scene so there's a place for the ambulance to attend and park close to the scene where it's safe. Safety is number one for every person that rocks up to the job anyway. So safety, number one, make sure you're safe. Fuel, batteries, power lines, trees, the list is endless. You know, oil on the road. So even when you're driving towards something, if there's oil that's been leaked, you know, it can be a hazard to you. Um, if you're able to, make space for the ambulance and then also make space close to a vehicle where a rescue appliance can pull up close enough for lighting if it's night time, as well as having the equipment. I think in a moment we'll walk out and we're going to go through some of the equipment that we as a brigade have. Um, we've got some ropes sitting in front of us here, um, a couple of bags, these are 200 metre ropes. We went to a job Wednesday last week where a vehicle was about 120 metres over an embankment um, an hour away from here on a very windy road, so up the Great Alpine Road towards Ensay. Five people in it. Um, you know, it looked very difficult if we had to set up ropes. We didn't have to, but if we had to set up ropes, it was, I think, about 70 degrees, you know, very steep, very shaly. Um, amazingly, at that stage, everyone was still alive, so quite incredible. Um, so I think what we might do is go out into our engine bay. We've got our truck out there. We've got the equipment. We'll get some of our members just to step through some of the gear that we've got and what it's used for. And, guys, if you've got questions throughout tonight, um, put them there on the chat and we will um, go through them. And I apologise for my dodgy camera work too. I might get one of the guys to um, hold the camera. <laughs> I'm good. I've got a moment. I'm actually. <laughs> Let me lean against this. Body, um, some of you guys might have noticed that our gear is a little bit different to our Wi-Fi gear. So BJ, in our typical Wi-Fi gear, you'll notice it's a two-piece and uh, the rescue guys are all in one-piece jumpsuits. Um, other things you'll notice, we've got a heap of pockets, carrying tools, carrying different sets of gear. Um, when we go to a job, we generally double glove. So you'll see Les has got uh, rubber gloves on as well as our uh, working gloves. Um, obviously, a helmet's a little bit different for getting into tighter spaces. 
Um, safety goggles are a little bit different than your typical bushfire safety goggles. Um, also on our gear, you'll see we've got knee pads and elbow pads. We're always leaning on something hard or something that might not um, be real nice on our skin. Um, wildfire helmet obviously has got a bit of a bit of lip on it. There's turns around, you see there's no lip on there. You've got different venting and stuff. Um, yeah, lots of pockets, very handy. Um, I keep two sets of gloves, for one for road crash and one for ropes, so we don't contaminate the ropes with any motor oil or glass or anything. Um, P2 masks, we take them with the job. Uh, it's good to um, have a, have a um, couple there for when you're cutting glass, you're not inhaling any, any nasties in there. Um, having a, a fair spare of, of whatever on you, whether it be the, the rubber gloves or the P2 mask is, um, is generally pretty good to have. Um, while we're standing here, I'll go through a bit of some of our gear. So Liz showing he's, he's got a whistle on there. We, we use that for communication when we're um, on, a, on a rope job. Uh, we might not be able to hear down the bottom. We might not have radio service. So we can use whistles as a, uh, to use our commands. Uh, he's also got a uh, seatbelt cutter and a, uh, a glass punch on there as well for um, cutting seatbelts and punching glass. But pretty self-explanatory. Um, this is some of our rope gear we've got. So we've got our rescue line. You'll notice it's an orange orange rope. So this is uh, 13 mil. Um, we've also got our belay line. So our belay lines are like our, um, like our uh, safety line and our orange line does most of the, the heavy lifting. Uh, behind us, we've got a lot of the gear we use to set up. So we've got things like, a, we've got a sling, so we can use that to make an anchor point around a tree or a, or a vehicle or something that we can uh, use as a, as a nice anchor. Uh, we've also got our MPD, so we use that. That's a, uh, a lowering device, and uh, it's got a it's set up with a pulley and a brake, and we can control the rope from the um, from the rescue end. Um, we've also got all sorts of um, carabiners and tri links, um, a lot of um, prussics, which are these little fellas down here. So we use them to tie onto other ropes. Um, we've got a heap of pulleys, um, now omni pulleys and prussic mining pulleys. Uh, we've also got some. Um, uh, Tape there as well, and we can use those for setting up um, different sorts of anchor points. Um, the other thing that we don't have sitting in here is a set of fours. Um, we've got uh, the stokes over in the corner here with the spine board, so we'll um, tie up to the orange and yellow cord up the top there, using our um, our orange and blue cords down here, and that, that carries most of the load. And then we'll tie our um, our operators to the the orange line as well, so they're um, secure to it. Um, we, yeah, the set of fours I was mentioning before, which are sitting there, but they, uh, we use them for all, all manner of things. You can use them for taking tension off the line to rechange and um, swap out things like the hyper bar. You can you can set it for either lifting or lowering down. Um, that pretty much covers. We use things like edge protection, and um, we might be walking uh, working around. Uh, cliff faces and things like that with sharp rocks or any of that sort of stuff. So we, we can put plastic down or um, we've got metal rollers and stuff that we can put the rope in to keep our uh, gear safe pretty much. Um, with the ropes, we also work with uh, redundancies too. So if we've got one thing doing something, we've always got something else that can uh, take the pressure as well. So we, um, we, we, we double safe pretty much as far as that goes. Cool. We've got a couple of questions, Phil. Yep. Um, are photos of the scene texted to the rescue while en route a good idea to assist? Very helpful. Yeah, and we've done that on a few occasions where we get people to uh, take photos, send it uh, to the appliance as it's en route, and that actually helps us enormously to set, you know, in our minds how we might go about when we arrive on scene. So, yep, really important. If anyone's on a job and they can um, go through VicFire or, you know, any other way of contacting the rescue, Yep, that's perfect. Um, so our next question's from Michael and uh, Source has partially answered it for us. Um, where I am, we don't have a CFA rescue, we have SES. Is there any other specific information we should pass on to Vic Fire for SES? Um, Source has said, particularly when a different agency is the rescue, um, it is worthwhile requesting Vic Fire to relay your sit reps to the responding um, RAR. Make the mod make a model of vehicle orientation, wheel side roof, and where the impact is 
will help RAR identify where airbags may be located. I'm sure Lakes will have further info on this. Yep. Um, and what is the response time for rescue? Is that response out the door or is that response to, to wherever? <laughs> so probably out the door. So we've got, um, it, once again, it depends on day time or night time. Um, we, we tend to try and be out the door in eight minutes. We work really hard to try and do that. But once again, it will depend. Sometimes it'll be less than that. Sometimes it might be a fraction more than that, but it's around that time. And the longest distance you've had to travel to an incident? Two hours. There you go, guys. That's the scope of the area that these guys, we cover. Yeah. Thanks. There's a question so far. All right. uh, just in relation to working in conjunction with SES, uh, SES that have got the Motorola radios, We've spoken to our neighbouring SES members and um, we've, we talk directly, you know, between both SES and CFA if required. <laughs> Les is wanting to take hold of the camera. <laughs> Phil's got the camera at the moment. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, yeah. I know. So let's have they're they're always a good bunch to work with. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at some of the other um, rescue equipment that we use. So we've got a range of battery and hydraulic equipment. Um, we've got lights and all sorts of stabilisation, uh, some of the stuff that we carry um, medically and so on um, here on the mat. Um, we've got our truck, which we're going to go and have a quick look at um, the stowage in that. Um, but I reckon if we kick off with um, Steve. Steve, you want to... Just run through some of the some of the equipment that we've got here. What's this thing, the red box? I think a few people might know what that is. Well, I don't know what that is. That's a defib. Um, most rescue vehicles will carry a defib now, and they're pretty user friendly. Um, training still involved, but uh, they're becoming more common, and they're primarily for protection of crew, but that wouldn't prevent us from using it. On a member of the public if needed. So, DPIMs are good things and becoming widely used, very popular. Um, we'll leave that alone. <laughs> right, so, John's going to do the e tools, I'm going to do the old prehistoric hydraulic tools. <laughs> Not really prehistoric, but this is a, a large cutter. So, basically, we connect it up to our hydraulic lines, which are Supplied by a pump on the back of the rescue. I'm going to do this next now. And it's, it's um, a fairly heavy unit, so sometimes, you know, lifting it up to do things at a higher elevated uh, position is hard work, and it does get tiring. Pretty much operate the open and close by a simple twist of the hand there. That's, that's all it takes, and the jaws will open fairly wide this is a larger cutter so we we could take in i guess 20 centimeters uh probably eight, larger eight inches at least yep at least and that'll that'll cut 120 ton yep worth of steel because cars these days are designed with multi skins in the pillars and they get tougher and tougher to get in, into so therefore the tools we use have to be better and better at uh, combating that that excess, so these will these will work fairly quickly until they're loaded. Sometimes I'll give the impression that they've stopped cutting, but you've just got to basically hold the hydraulic switch on and let it keep cutting. And, and sometimes it goes off with a bang, sometimes it doesn't. But uh, it's amazing how much they'll they'll cut through. So, um, Can I ask you a question, Steve? Um, how much control do you have if it's going the wrong way? Can you pull it back and make it do what you want it to do? Or has you just got to let it do what it's, you um, know? The, the closing of the jaws will influence where the tool, where the tool goes. Um, you, you actually can't fight it, um, but you can reposition the tool so you can, you can take a better, a better shot at what you're trying to cut. So um, we always work on the outside of the, of the tool. Never put yourself between the tool and the vehicle because once, you, once your hydraulics get started, um, they're going to go wherever they want to go. So can I ask you another question then, Steve? So if, um, 
just putting you on the spot. So if uh, little Johnny, who was a bystander, thought I can pick that tool up and I reckon I can have a go at cutting that vehicle up, and um, or do you reckon that they'd, they'd have a fair idea how to manage the tool or, or is there really the training, the artwork of, of managing a tool, there's a, there's a lot more to it than just picking it up and just whacking yeah, it on something. Very much. Johnny could try and pick it up, and I don't think he would, because <laughs> it's very heavy. Um, the, the tool the tool will drive itself, and and yes, to understand where it's where it's headed, uh, what its function, what it's going to do, and how it's going to react to what you're trying to cut, is what we train for. That's it's all about understanding why we're doing it and where to cut. Where to cut? Yeah. So what about on an electric car? Can you cut anywhere on an electric car? No. No. Oh. <laughs> Um, electric cars, um, uh, as hybrids become more common, we have to know more about the construction of the hybrid vehicles. Uh, if you happen to cut into a, a uh, line, you can you can basically become live um, at uh, high voltage. You can set off discharges by uh, just if you're willy nilly cutting anywhere. The place to know where your discharges are for airbags, for seatbelt tensioners, all sorts of um, charges within the units these days. Um, so schematics and knowledge of vehicles now is a, is a very beneficial tool that we, that we try to have when, uh, when we're doing our job. So it's not just pick up, have a go. No. Oh. <laughs> so that means I can't do it then. <laughs> um, under supervision, we're, we're more than happy to let people have a go. Um, but that's under supervision. Thanks, mate. <laughs> We, we might have a go with the battery tool battery afterwards. Tool. We might cut. I'll see there's, there's a door over there. I think we might have a go at that after. So, Phil, generally, how long does it take to train someone up? Um, the, the training, how we operate is we tend to get all of our members, all members, to participate in training. Um, and that means to give them exposure of what it actually looks like on a job. They may never want to uh, acquire the accreditation of cutting a vehicle up, but they are part of the team. And those people that want to pursue to undertake the course, um, it's, it's a fairly long period of time. It's several months of training. And then the assessment is, um, you know, fairly, uh, it's not over the top, but you do it as a team. So a team assessment. We're about to redo our, um, accreditation uh, and that's that's going to be over an evening but you know it'll be with six people that's a brigade accreditation that's not a brigade, individual not accreditation individual. but Sarah you could probably answer that because you've been there <laughs> um yeah it, so the dozen or so that were trained from Bansdale it was over many months yes. um that we were trained we came down weekends we came down evenings um just training um, and then it was pretty much to get to all of us through, it was over a weekend to be assessed in teams of two, um, going through lots of different scenarios and it's theory and practical and yeah, it's quite full on. Oh, so it's not practical. You can pick yeah. up like Steve just talked about, he, <laughs> he just said it was easy. <laughs> little Johnny, no, he didn't say Little Johnny. I think, the biggest thing, I think the biggest thing is knowing where to do because you can actually do more damage to a vehicle as in, it makes it harder to get someone out um, if you don't know what you're doing properly. You can um, peel open the skin on the door, which then makes us harder to actually get in. So it's actually knowing what you're doing and where the best thing is to do. What do you got there, Steve? This is a medium size spreader. Um, we can get into small gaps. Uh, sometimes we have to create the gap. So we can, we can crush a quarter panel which will open up the gap between the door and the, the, uh, the bottom of the pillar sort of thing. So with that, we can force doors open, we can force boots open, bonnets open. We can, we can crush sills to create um, ram points. Um, Multi-use multi tool, basically. It's spreader so we can, we can even jack vehicles with it. Uh, we can lift, lift, I won't say jack, we can lift vehicles. Slow controlled, um, and different functions. Help me out, someone. No, that's, <laughs> that's what we did last week. Yeah. So would that would that lift a car? 
Yes. Oh, okay. All right. It, it lifted Jackaroo quite well. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm glad you left the, the wheels on my car last week. <laughs> the limitations with these tools are the fact that they're hydraulic. They have the main attached to a hydraulic line, whether it be off the back of the unit or whether it's out of a portable pump, which is this one here. But we've still got a hydraulic line that we have to manage as well as, as the tool itself. John's going to show you the e-tools and they come up with a real benefit, being portability and uh, away from the hoses. Any questions along the way? <laughs> Not yet. Ballarat run a six-month course, um, including assessment, then ease into jobs, and plenty in Epping run a joint course to get members qualified as well. Yeah, Matty B. Good to see you online, mate. <laughs> Right now, I'm holding a ram. Uh, again, it's a hydraulic, so we're attached to a hydraulic line. A ram is mostly used for creating space, um, ash rolls, pushing parts of cars apart, um, occasionally lifting. Um, this is a two stage, again, it's heavy too, so little Johnny's going to struggle with this one. Um, it's a two stage ram, and at its full extent, It'll go about a metre, 50 millimetres long. How so, do you know that? Because uh, we, we've got it written on it. <laughs> 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 and I'm the bloke that wrote it off. So. <laughs> we've, had, um, we've got two stage, single stage and three stage. So our three stage would add to about 13.50. And the two stage goes about 750, 750 millimetres. So um, yeah, we can work in between that. You can put that in the vehicle, you can put um, blocks behind it. So there's, there's plenty of ways we can use these. You push up, down, and they're also controlled with that. Just a little twist there. Um, you've always got to be cautious of the ram actually slipping. Um, you know, if you push a lot of weight, push something apart, it's got a lot of weight on it. If it slips, then that's placing everyone at risk. Um, yeah. That's, that's about the use of the rams. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, your new little tool? All this gear is heavy. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah. Except our, our little tool. Oh, little tool. Yeah. Now, little Johnny could pick this one up. This is a paddle cutter. Um, but basically, self-explanatory. It's used for cutting pedals. Uh, uh, some, of the, some of the accidents we've attended, people get trapped. Obviously, when a vehicle's crushed, down around their feet, they can get pinned by pedals. Um, we've had accidents where we're unable to move the pedals because we can't get the big tools in. That's where one of these comes into play. Small enough, portable enough, and you can get it in and that'll cut any decent pedal or steering wheel. Uh, very helpful. Um, I can't really add to that. Yeah, basically, basically good to get into tight places. For confined space, yeah, for yeah. anything that's confined space. And that particular, that style of cutter is very handy because it doesn't push off um, like some of the other types of cutters. It's just a shear. Yeah. Just straight out, you know, it's like a, like a pair of side cutters. Yeah. So I'm just going to introduce you. That's been Steve. Thanks, Steve. That's awesome. Um, this is John Upton, who is um, on the executive for the Rescue Association. Um, and um, some of you may have heard of Daryl Willison before. He's been involved in rescue for many years. He's a member of our brigade. Um, John's taken on the mantle of working with the Rescue Association. Um, John, um, I noticed that our tools are blue, but I've seen some other coloured tools out there. What brand are they? And they start with a H, don't they? Old Metro or something? Old Metro. Old Metro. Old Metro. Old Metro. Um, yeah, we're purely a Lucas, Lucas tool brigade. Um, we have tried Old Metro, don't like it. A lot of other brigades love it. Uh, but we stick with our Lucas and we find the Lucas is much more durable than what some of the other gear out there is, whether it be all the other names. Um, we haven't had any trouble with our Lucas gear whatsoever, uh, except for one um, Pompey tool, which seized up for some reason. We don't know why, but uh, that's the only problem we've had with any of our tools. We've basically, basically worn them out and they've replaced them with new gear for us. So that's how good the Lucas gear is. 
So John, this battery stuff, how good is that so, stuff? Yeah, so the new uh, e-hydraulic gear uh, that we've just received, we've had it for about six or eight months now, maybe a little bit more. Um, it is really, really good gear. Uh, don't have to connect up a, um, a hose line to it. You uh, shoot a battery in the back of it, the new lithium ion batteries. Um, you put the battery in it and off you go. And uh, they'll last probably two or three um, episodes of, of, of um, incidents if you need to. Usually we, we put them on charge as soon as we get back. Uh, they're probably not quite as heavy as the other gear, but they're just as good. Now, this is a um, set of spreaders I've got. This is our spreader, new spreader. They, they all work the same way as what the uh, hydraulic line gear does. So, um, you really want it on. Yeah. Oh, so, so we can hear her. So there's our battery here. Quick, quick. Uh, uh, very, very handy for uh, if we've got a job down over an embankment. And with our rope gear now, we can get this lowered down and we don't have to worry about trying to take down petrol motors and hydraulic lines and whatever. Uh, we can take down um, our spreaders, which we've got a set of spreaders, which is those ones. Yeah. John, just a question while you're yeah. picking up the next tool. Is all the gear CFA supplied or brigade supplied or a bit of both? Well, um, it's a bit it's of both. A, it is a bit of both, isn't it? Yeah, we, 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 we're, uh, we're, all brigades are supplied with the basics. Um, and if it's necessary, the brigades go and buy a lot of their own. And some of this gear is not cheap. It's pretty expensive. There's, there's a lot not really know. So now this one. So what, 100 bucks wouldn't buy one? It wouldn't even be a deposit on one. So batteries I hear about. Get the wood for the 100 bucks. These are about $800 or so. Oh, it's dry. Um, we've just got another four, I think, and another couple of charges. Um, they last, as I said before, with the um, spreaders. They'll last an incident very easy and possibly even longer, but we put them on charge when we come back. Uh, this is another new piece of our uh, battery gear, which is a combi tool. Now, what I say by a combi tool, it is a cutter and a spreader, all in one. So if you spread like that, we can crush, and that's our cutters in, in the centre there. Okay, yeah, you can take the tip off if you want to. Yeah. Just the really good thing with the battery is you can hear how quiet it is when it's not running. Obviously, there's no sound at all. Whereas when we have the generator running, there's constant sound. So, yeah. um, that's the combat tool set up as cutters, and with the tips on that, that actually keeps the spreaders on the side. And the, the, the power of these is just as good as what the um, hydraulic uh, line gear is. It, it's, it's unbelievable. You think, yeah, you're going to stall it. It just keeps on going. So, uh, it's a All right, I reckon, you know, we can talk about the cutters as well and so on, but they're pretty much the same as yeah. the hydraulic, but just a battery form. Um, I just wondered, Les, whether you'd like to talk a bit about some of the other gear that we've got with... Um, I'm going to talk about the stab fast over the back. Stab fast. Stab what? fast. So we've got here to um, stabilise the vehicle. Just watch how you get stabbed. Um, used on the supersonic on this roof or on the side. Um, it's got to be three points of contact. So you've got one on the ground, one on the vehicle, and you've got a third one here. It will actually hook onto the vehicle somewhere. And then it's just actually just a ratchet tightened up, and then it, it makes the vehicle a solid, solid, um, not movable. Then you just chop it um, as you need to make it a stable platform. For the, for so why, why is it important to be stable? Is there a good reason for that? Well, we don't want any, any move. You've got to, patient in there, you don't want more, more injuries done to the patient. So it's um, basically just to keep the vehicle steady as you can, and then you can cut and work around that. Mm. You know, you don't have the effect of it moving, you know, if you're working on the slope, but you don't want the car to be taken off down the hill after you. So, no, yeah. your, uh, so in the training, I know that, you know, placement of any, any stabilisation and stab fast, whether it's chocks or airbags which we'll we will talk about airbags in a minute but um placement is really important isn't it so that it doesn't impede your plan yeah well that's right you want you don't want to put the gear and set it up and then decide oh we want to take the door out that's behind that stab pass so it's a matter of setting your plan up and putting your stabilization 
set that up first and then work to where you want to um, get into from here. So maybe another question. Growing a Les, you're doing a good job here, so we'll keep firing questions. Um, so does your, does your first plan always work? Never. Oh. Never. Not never. never. <laughs> well, some, maybe some slight, slight, slight hints and tips and tricks and things. But, um, you start off with a plan, you try to really modify it and, and achieve the, the end goal. Yeah. So you need to be adaptable. You need to have plan A, plan B, plan C, and adapt in between. Exactly. Yeah, and so because it's not like it's uh, you know you turn up to an MBA, as I think was mentioned before, no MBA is the same as you know the previous one you've been to. So you've got to keep adapting. You so, may you may think it's the same. It may look like the same to begin with, and then you go, nah, it's not the same. Oh yeah, we've done this before, and then nah, the patient's trapped a bit differently. They're in a different spot, or it's a different angle, or. Um, different things, so yeah. Well, you turn up to an incident, oh, yeah, it's the same as the last one, right? Oh, there's two deceased in the car because of the way it's You just don't know. It can be influenced by patients as well. If, uh, if your ambos are on scene and they need someone out as, as soon as possible, then that can change the dynamics of the job. We might have to act faster to achieve what we might have taken more time to do. But uh, if the ambos say we've got to get them out, we've got to get them out. So we do it fast and safely. Yeah, very mm. good. Mm. All right, well, let's just have a bit of a peruse at the last lot of stuff that we got on the mat. Um, what do you got there, Les? Got a bit of protection. So we put this between the patient and the cutters um, just to give them a heap of protection and to give them a bit of, um, bit of security, especially if they're, they're awake and they're alert what's going on. Uh, and we always talk to the patient, whatever we're gonna do, we always tell them what's, what's happening. Um, so they're not, um, not a shock to what's gonna happen in the next. So, uh, we always keep talking to them. even if even if they're not um, conscious. We always like to just to yell out and tell them what's going on. You just never know. Uh, so we've got other bits of protection we use just to put around after we cut. We'll actually put these little protections over any sharp objects that are, that are done from around the vehicle. They're all different sizes and shapes and all sorts of things we use. Um, for that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, what's that thing there on top of that witch's hat? This would be just a normal. <laughs> Russian beacon, so probably most fire trucks have those on, on board now. They have normally have a little pad you can put them on the road, so a little e, e, e flare. Yep. Well, as most trucks, I think most CFA units would have those on board, I would think. Yep. Yep. So I noticed we've got what's what's this thing down here? This is a funny looking thing. This here is a windscreen cutter. They put that on the end of a drill, and then it just works like a pair of scissors. So you actually punch a hole in the glass. And then you just put this in and it'll just chop wow. around. Actually, before we actually do it, you actually have to put shaving cream around the windscreen. Why do we do that? To stop the shards from going and blowing over the patient or over us. Shaving cream is great for that. Actually, those shards. Yeah, so really important, as mentioned before, P2 masks. Yep. You breathe in, you know, shards of glass. Once it's in your lungs, it's in your esophagus. Once it's in there, it's not coming out. So, yeah, people, anyone that's seen glass shards in sunlight will understand what it's like cutting glass and breaking glasses. Uh, yeah, a really nasty thing, and you need to make sure that your protection's in place. And we also make sure protection's on our patients, don't we? Exactly. Everything. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Put glasses on, the mask on, the if, you know, it's possible, it's as much as you can. Yep. And ensure Ambos or anyone yep. in the car has got that too. Um, most Ambos now they've got the safety helmet on board these now, the, the white one. So that's good. Um, Occasionally uh, have to remind them to do that too. Um, <laughs> suction cups just to grab the glass as we pull them out. Um, then we just got normal factory operated tools that sometimes you don't have to actually cut, you can actually unbolt the door. So it might be quicker just to unbolt the door than actually try to cut it. So that's a, another quick way to, to, to remove a panel if you need to. Beautiful. Um, let's talk about airbags, um, and then we'll just walk around the truck, and then we're gonna. I think we're gonna cut this door up. So, John, you're uh, a wealth of knowledge in airbags because you're full of hot air. Um, can you blow that up for me? I will. Yeah, give me the cylinder out there, and I will. Okay. Um, so yes, we have, we carry three airbags on our vehicle. Um, they have a piece of timber the same, or a piece of ply the same size to put under them so that they don't uh, 
it puts you to stones or rocks or anything like that on the ground. Uh, and it's to go in under a very fine combined, uh, fine or thin uh, narrow space to raise something up. You might have to move it very far to um, get something free, but um, yeah, and that, that airbag there is, uh, can lift up to 40 tonne. So uh, we've got, as I said, we've got three of those on board, so we can, we can use them at different stages around the vehicle if necessary, just to ease it up off the ground. If certainly if something's um, half out of the vehicle with an arm squashed underneath, you can't get anything else under it to get a, an airbag, that's what we use. We have a set of cylinders on the truck with some gauges. They are connected up to the bag and it is slowly uh, filled with air. So, um, oh, yeah, there's no set of gauges there. Yeah, so yeah, so that's our gauge and our operating tools there. Put the hose and the um, cylinder in between and off we go. I notice that we've got a freeloader here. <laughs> He's sitting in the car. <laughs> um, you trapped in there, sir? Yes. Do you need, uh, what, what do you need us to do? I don't know, just get me out. Get you out? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> no, no, I don't think we'll use the hooligan tool. I reckon, I reckon we might um, get up and uh, just take the top off this door and just um, show how quickly and easily it is to cut through, um, through this metal. No, I'm not doing it. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, so, them, yeah, hooligan tool, brilliant piece of kit. A lot of there's appliances, a lot of appliances have got these, but absolutely fantastic on cars. Um, yeah, just being able to gain access to cut through, make what we call third doors in the back of a coupe or something like that. You can take the outer skin off and so on. A lot of the newer technology cars. Boy, are they tough and they are really, really, really difficult to get access in. We were down at um, Lang Lang last year. We we're having a play with uh, one of uh, the vehicles that's relatively current and you could cut the outer skin off, but trying to get into the back of a, you know, uh, coupe, very difficult, very, very tough. So don't have an accident in coupe because it's really difficult to get people out. I do like the can opener effect that we can use. Uh, put a hole in a panel uh, or a window. Um, so a hole for the stab fast, for the hook on the stab fast. This can be used for wedging a door open, a bonnet open. Um, even in a structure fire, you can, you can jam doors open with that. You know, so that's the, the fine point of it. I've so used the can opener side in a structure fire to get open in like a garage. You, you peel a roof off a vehicle if, if no, other, no other way in, you could cut a hole. Just like a can opener, just work along and that'll peel it open. Yeah. Um, you're going through the roof. Yeah. All right. It's a good tool. So if you want to go and grab the, um, I don't know, let's use a combi tool. E e e yeah, e Com one of the e-cutters, you just work out what you want to do. Just look after that bloke we in there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to uh, remove the top end of this door to get this clown out of this car. So, uh, So that's how easy it is with the electric, the um, battery electric tools. Um, Save so, so much time, as you can see, we picked it up and straight into it.
Oh, Let's wait there for a second, Les. Also, while he's got that tool there, we can call the combi tool. Um, we can put that in there and spread that if, if we had something jammed yeah. in there. Hey, Les, you got a convertible, mate. Yep. <laughs> you got the camera on that? So that's how easy it is to uh, remove bits and pieces from the vehicle. You don't have to take the tips off if it's smaller stuff like we're cutting. The tips can stay on. If, if you get anything bigger, you probably need to take them off as they do hinder you at times. But uh, that's what we call our combi tool. Very, very um, neat piece of gear. Yeah. Yeah, Matty B, I'll, I can talk to you about the, the cylinders at some stage, but um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> What's wrong with should the we, Should we have a walk around? Yep, let's do a bit of a walk around. We'll start, um, start at the back. So basically this is um, where our rams are kept and also a spreader, small spreaders. Cutters are mounted here. We have uh, Stokes litter normally goes pretty dark, but it's up in through there. We've got a broom for cleaning up after you know, after the jobs, our stab fast goes in the centre. We've got blocks. We've got a high lift jack that sits in here. All right, so high lift jack right there. Yes, might be an old mechanical type tool, but absolutely brilliant. Of course, we've got our chairs up there because we've got to sometimes sit on the side of the road for a while. Um, we've got, yeah, got to look after those old blokes. Um, this is where we carry some of our tools and tarps here our hydraulic, our main hydraulic pump. This is all our first aid, uh, all the medical stuff and certainly um, the things that are important to maintain hydration for people out on the job. Um, sunscreen, all that sort of stuff as well. Blankets, um, that's what's kept in there including uh, some of our sharps protection generator. Um, we've got spray paint and all sorts of things in, uh, in these drawers, spray paint, shaving cream. Got all sorts of different things, snatch blocks. Uh, we keep tools in there, that small right. portable, yep, small portable pump that we've got, witches hats, uh, extension cords, Lots of ropes that we carry and we'll just walk around the front. So it's a, we can carry, um, we can carry five people um, in this vehicle uncomfortably in the back. Not all, of, not all of them in the back, but yeah, three in the back uncomfortably because the seat's not very comfortable, but it's an old truck. It's uh, well over 20 years old now, but it's still a, a good appliance. We've outgrown it though. We just can't fit all our gear on it. So then we've got to pull out sections for lighting, which a lot of this has been upgraded and updated. We've got chargers and so on in there. We've got a surfer, we've got chains, snatch straps, blocks, four blocks. Yep. Les, what are we doing? Wooden blocks? Yep. And we've got plastic. More hydraulic lines over more the back. More hydraulic lines and more airbags. Yep. And plates under the airbags. Yep. So general tools, chainsaw, air, just blowers, hooligan tool goes in here, a lot of manual tools. Um, so that's basically our vehicle um, and equipment we've got. We're currently in the throes of, um, so we've got the rails fired up here, two of them. Um, we're currently in, in the throes of getting a support vehicle because where we cover um, is so huge that we don't want to take our rescue 
solely out of our primary area. So we're, we've, um, fortunately with VSEP, we were able to gain some support through the VSEP funding. We put in a significant amount of money towards fitting out uh, an Isuzu four wheel drive. Once again, because I mentioned before, the areas that we go, it's diverse, it's, it's large, a lot of off road stuff. So we're gonna carry the, uh, a lot of our e-tools on there as well as ropes, and that'll be our technical rescue response vehicle. Couple of questions. Yep. Uh, when the rescue truck goes in for its annual service, do you get a spare or are you taken offline for that time? No, so that's, that's a bit of a difficult one. So we usually try and get that managed um, through the demos, and we have had spares in place. But once again, very difficult to get a spare, and I know that um, it's one of the things that Rick has been working really, really hard on making sure that the spares that are available are fitted out ready for action. So, yeah. And how many rescue members would you normally run on the truck? So we tend to, the standard rule is minimum of two accredited rescue people. We tend to have a bit more than that. We've got, we've got a support vehicle currently, which is a, an Isuzu four wheel drive. So we have backup follow up people in that. So we'll tend to rock out the door depending on what the job is. It's always depending on what the job is. But we tend to get out the door with four COVID-19, five outside of COVID-19 in, in this vehicle. And you've got your rescue and you've also got the guys from Banstar. Absolutely. So once again, we have uh, three people from Banstar um, maximum. Um, we know that. Um, occasionally we do get more than that, but you know we, we tend to bank on if we got support coming from that direction. We'll go, we got three from there. Um, and yeah, that's basically for road crash. Ben style CFA, we've got, I can't even remember how many three. we've got. Three rope. Three rope. And um, road crash is- I think there's six of us now. Six, yeah. Yep. so yeah. And, and we've got a good bunch here too. So yeah, but we're about to re, you know, revisit that because we've got a lot of newer members that have been with us for uh, a period of time. and. Anthony's keen to jump on board and get well and truly, and BJ as well. And we've got lots of lots of people who have been with us for a little while. We haven't run a full course for quite a while. So we're looking forward to having additional people. But some of us have been around, been in it for a long time, and we just need to make sure that we've got really good people, good stocks, ready to roll out the door at any time. Well, hopefully that's been informative. And if, if there's any questions, yep. That's great. If not, yeah, I might just flick back to you. Here, okay. Um, do we have any questions, guys? Any other questions? Anyone want to make any comments um, at all? Look, can I just mention about um, um, there's been a group of people, and I was very fortunate to go through this um, process um, pre COVID 19 and during COVID 19 that. Um, for accreditation for road crash assessors um, right across the state. There's been a real awareness that there's a need for people to be out there. I know that there's a number of people that are online tonight that are uh, have been going, that have gone through the assessment aspect of things for road crash. And hopefully, you know, if if there are people out there and you're near a road crash brigade and you feel you can, you know, contribute in any way, there's some people probably that you can talk to. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, very much thanks. I'd like to thank Phil, John, Anthony, BJ, Steve and Les for um, coming along tonight. Um, it's been a really informative night. I hope everyone's got a lot out of it and I'm standing like right behind a light. <laughs> um, Don't break that door. <laughs> oh, question. If on scene and waiting for a rescue unit to arrive, what would be your top tips? Okay. Most important thing is safety for you first, which we mentioned earlier on. You know what? People that are trapped in a vehicle are people. Being there for them is number one. Um, I should have mentioned earlier on, um, well often at, at this job where we had two people that were trapped in a vehicle upside down, there was a girl who was 20, was in the vehicle for two hours. And just to lie in the back of this vehicle and to hold her for that period of time and talk to her while she became unconscious um, was, you know, a, quite a privilege. It might sound a bit weird, but um, spending time with people that um, I think it's really important. 
for them to know that they're not alone. And, um, you know, someone that gets the opportunity to spend time with people in their greatest time of need is important. So if you turn up to a scene, you mightn't like what you see, but if you can, if you can bring yourself to talk to these people, that's important. And the other information that you can glean and pass on to triple zero is vital. Really, really important. So I think that that's, that's a critical thing. And I, I would think that, you know, across the board, you know, in our, in our brigade, um, there's been times that all of our members have spent time with people. And uh, the good story of this particular girl, which I'm happy to say, I got a phone call from a mum last week, only about two and a bit weeks ago that this occurred. Um, she had a broken, she was basically scalped uh, on one side of her face. Um, hundred and something, 120 or 30 stitches in her head, um, broken neck, broken back, broke, shattered shoulders, broken pelvis, compound fracture of the femur. Um, went unconscious, you know, in two of our arms, one on either side of her. Um, I have photos on my phone of her sitting up in Melbourne, smiling. Um, pretty, pretty amazing. It was pretty impressive. Yeah, to, to have that opportunity to spend and, and to save people's lives. It's, it's not what we, we don't set out to do that, but it's pretty impressive when that's the outcome. Doesn't always work that way. Um, we've had some other really nasty ones, but um, once again, being in the country, uh, knowing the people that you're out there serving and caring for um, is a real, it's a privilege, you know, to, to have the opportunity to go and spend time with families afterwards is, is important. So they're people, a lot of people hurt and just keep looking after yourself. It's okay, I will say, and I said this to everyone last week, it's okay if you're not okay to go out on a date. You know, if you're not feeling up to it, I've been to jobs where, and I demoed it last week, I got down on my all fours, we went to a really nasty job. I hadn't actually been to look at it. They said, there's three deceased person in this, in this vehicle. Someone's still alive. There's a son alive in the vehicle. I had to draw breath, I got on all fours. Had to set the scene for myself before I could front that, was, you know. But there's some days that you go, I'm actually having a bad day. You know what? It's a real strength if you can recognise, you know, don't feel forced, never feel forced to be put in a situation you're not going to be able to cope with. And that's in everything we do in CFA. Anything. BA wearing, going out to a job of whatever it might be. Even if it's, I've had a really bad day and if I go down to training, I'm just, I'm not in a good mood. Um, maybe it might be the best thing for you. You just got to work that out. But it, acknowledging that in yourself is a strength. And I look to my members to mentor that in caring for each other and caring for themselves. Thanks um, very much, Phil. And um, I totally value your leadership and your um, work that you've had with Bansdale and ourselves. So thank you very much. Um, that's it for tonight. I'll finish up. Um, but next week, I believe we've got um, David Rice, who's a MICA paramedic coming on board, which actually matches in well with this week. So um, David's, um, David or I'll say Ricey, we've worked with him a lot. Again, that's a massive benefit of being in the country. Um, I spent seven years in, um, out of, in 13 before I moved down to Bansdale. And a really big difference down here is, you know the Ambos, you know the cops that you're gonna be working with and we've worked with them a lot. So Ricey is one of those ones. He reminds me of the time that I held an IV bag for a couple of hours when it wasn't even connected into the person. Um, but <laughs> won't let me forget that one. Um, they forgot to tell me they'd unhooked it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Ricey's on next week. So if you've got any questions or any topics you'd like Ricey to discuss, um, flick us a message. Um, thanks again. And it is recorded, so I'll um, share it up to the Google Drive when I get it down. Have a good and safe week, everyone. And thanks again to the Lakes and Bansdale guys for tonight. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. See ya. Bye. Good, very good. I'll um, turn the Thanks, news guys. on.